call the uh, Enterprise Committee meeting to order. Um, and uh, how about uh, we'll introduce everybody around? Okay, let's start. Good morning, I'm Ron Elliott, the PM for Safe Storm Health. Uh, Steve Rabuffo, Director of the Fort Anchorage. Jim Deere from Fort Anchorage. Suzanne Flynn Green, Mayor's Office. Uh, Amy Dubofsky. Tim Steele. So um, I don't have a uh, anything but a generalized agenda for us. So really, it's kind of up to you, all right, in terms of how you want to tell us the story, where we are, and what we're doing, and um, all that kind of stuff. Well, we can, you know, we why don't we begin by letting Milan just give you the update okay. on all the project-related task force and where we are and status of all those. And then the other thing that we wanted to do was to. Make, make sure that you got an understanding of how we got to the $290 million yep. uh, for the uh, for the legislative program this year. Um, we've been talking about a higher number in the past, but uh, knowing that it would have been a challenge to go back, it's a challenge enough as it is, but to go back there with a challenge with a bigger number than that, uh, send us back to the drawing board a little bit, not to modify what the end design is going to be, but to modify how much money we would ask the, the legislature to provide for this and how we would handle the rest. So and it basically is a timing issue. You're trying to get a couple of phases through uh, with this and then by that time then you'll be ready for the other and you will have uh, won the uh, lawsuit. And, 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 then, yeah, and, and then there are some other cost avoidance things that the port is capable of doing. If you know if the legislature can can support this, that that allows us to put dollars in the bank because now we're deferring maintenance on a dock that's going to get replaced and don't have to do it anymore. And by the time you get from the date you start to the date you would need it, you know we've got a sizable chunk of money in the bank and can carry ourselves over the finish line. So you know all of that had to get factored into how do you get a lower number uh, and one you could potentially be more palatable. So we'll go into that. And the graphic is there, and you've probably got your own uh, cable size one to look at as well. Yep. Okay. So go for it. And one, you know, one more piece of uh, administrative business. Uh, Jim Jager has introduced himself uh, this morning. Jim's our new director of external affairs down at the port. Uh, and when Mark Johnston is here, and he's the only guy, he's going to introduce Jim Jager <laughs> as the as the external affairs director for MLMP. Uh, Jim is the guy we're sharing. So. <laughs> You're on the outs with both I'm organizations. I'm elected by the board. Yeah. yeah. You know, Where's your expertise, man? He's talking about things. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds like Amy. Yeah, he, he's, he's pretty good at climbing the learning curve. Well, that's that's impressed me so far. All right, yeah, go for it. Okay, so on you've got. <laughs> good morning. Um, the report that you have in front of you that covers two months uh, since it was not a December ADC meeting, we combined two months worth of reports. Um, there's been no change in the format, and I'll just, I'll just go through it. Um, and no change to our contract, stage two end contract status. Um, we uh, have three completed task orders, uh, uh, most recent one being task order six, which was completed the design, build procurement for land site building, which is a programming function. Uh, there's been no new task orders since the last update. Um, so I'd like to talk about work in progress. Uh, task Force 2, which is our PMO office uh, on the port, um, there's been no change in that status. <coughs> the electronic document management system that we talked about is in use, and uh, we're still in full system development to uh, basically make sure that all the documents are where they're supposed to be, um, uh, what we call migration, but uh, uh, it is in use while that goes on. Task Order 4, uh, which is a test file uh, program, uh, construction management is, is underway. We'll talk about the contract uh, the two ways down below. Um, we've been putting a lot of effort on the um, being sure to obtain permits uh, in time to allow spring installation. <coughs> we've completed the revision of the IHA and resubmitted to NIMPS. Uh, we've worked with them. They posted the Federal Register and, and uh, opened the public comment period. That is scheduled uh, to to close tomorrow, and at that point we'll be working with NIMS while they respond to any comments. Uh, there's also a Section Seven consultation going on within NIMS. Um, in conjunction with that, we've been pursuing.
proceeding on, on how to monitor uh, the uh, marine mammals. Uh, so we did a marine mammal monitoring and mitigation plan revision and resubmitted this plans to make sure that we comply with their requirements. Uh, we've updated our underwater noise monitoring plan and uh, have had minor comments on that. A lot of this effort, of course, is, is aimed primarily at, at, at the uh, beluga waves. Um, task Order 5, uh, that's basically the design, pre preliminary design functions and precursor functions for procurement for the marine terminals, uh, Terminal 1 and 2 and both POLs. Uh, major thing on that is um, we, we completed a, a report uh, responding to recommendations from the GHC on seismic uh, requirements and standards, um, uh, reactive performance requirements. We briefed the municipal manager on that and then we briefed the GAC on it also. Um, the briefing, I feel, was well received on both parts, but uh, uh, and uh, the GAC has responded uh, um, with a recommendation. Um, uh, basically, uh, their recommendation that we were looking at was ensuring that PLO1 and Terminal 2 be designed in a manner that keep it functional after a major seismic event. The approach we came up with was, and came up with several approaches. The one that was selected to carry forward to the GAC, um, we briefed them on all of them, but uh, was the lowest cost. And it basically used uh, interim Bailey Bridge and power construction on Terminal 2 um, that we we're going to build anyway uh, during construction and use during construction to retain that capability. And in the event of a seismic uh, event, we would redeploy them within a week and restore the structure at no additional cost other than the storage of the Bailey units. And then we we're going to follow the same approach on PLO 2 uh, or PLO 1. Not to get deep into the engineering, but what we found that when we were studying the seismic performance of the structures, the wars themselves would survive the design event uh, with only minor upgrades that we could that were within the, the budget of the structures themselves, minor rebar and connection upgrades. The uh, the weak point comes with the trestles, and especially as they approach land and the water becomes shallower, uh, there's more force on the connection of the trestle that they would fail. So the choices were to over-design them to, to, to not fail, to um, design them with a um, uh, way to uh, 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 carry the load temporarily or to basically, um, uh, we thought the most cost-effective way was to uh, use the Bailey Bridges and once the Bailey Bridges, they'll have been used already and been tried out proven and once they're in use, um, uh, uh, that gives us time to actually repair the original trestles. Bailey Bridges are mobile? Uh, they're, uh, they're, yes, they're a yeah, uh, portable metal bridge. If you've seen a World War II movie or yeah. a World War movie, that's what they use to go across rivers and they're quite common um, and we, we're, we're planning to use them anyway. Uh, what, do you, what do you use them for now? Well, we don't use them now, okay. but we're going to need to use them gotcha. in the construction of Terminals 1 and 2 okay. because as you begin to move to north, yeah. you know, they, need, you know, they need to have their hatches line up with trestles. Uh, during the design process, uh, there's going to be a part of that where that won't happen, but in order to keep them on schedule, they're going to need a temporary trestle arrangement yeah. to, uh, to be able to get cargo on and off the ship. What's the length of a painting? Uh, they vary in length, yeah. so we would we would obviously purchase one right size yeah. to the new distance between the, the dock face and the uh, and, and the shoreline. And, and and once we bought them for the project, we we've got them. All we have to do is store them, and they store outside. Uh, so the, the the cost to us is a footprint that they have to be kept on. Yes. Um, I have come. Um, in terms of the uh, monitoring the, uh, the beluga, uh, is that acoustic and visual, or how is it done? We'll be doing. We'll we'll be we'll be performing acoustic monitoring of the power driving noise. We'll, we'll be performing visual monitoring of the of the beluga uh, if they enter into the, into the zone. Uh, then somebody will be tasked with that responsibility. Yes, yeah, the contractor will okay. be tasked with that responsibility. Uh, I want to mention the record in Mr. Training. Sorry about being late. That's all right. Hey, you're on the rest. So we're working with uh, Keywit in order to make sure they're 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 coming up on their, their due point for their their monitoring.
discussing today. And the GAC has responded uh, uh, with an endorsement, written endorsement of, of, of that design approach, including it into the at and So we've been able to close that that effort uh, and you know, allow us to move forward in our preliminary design. Is there a geotechnical report of some sort that uh, gives you an idea as to the direction of motion or uh, intensity expected or design standard? Yes, um, DRS had done one, uh, performed one. Uh, when we uh, when we started up, uh, we asked them to update it, and they did. They brought it current to the fourth location, and we've been using that. Okay. And the GAC uh, is okay with that.
when you when you put those in, do you do you drive them in until you can't drive them anymore and then cut them off? Is that the theory, or do you what, what what's the uh, what's the mechanism? Well, the goal is is, is um, to drive them into a certain elevation. We don't think they will drive them to what's called refusal. We yeah. can't get any further. We there's a hard kill layer. Uh, there's actually two hard kill layers, and our goal is in the in the sediment profile. And our goal is to actually get them. To 15 feet within that first hard kill layer to maximize the resistance, uh, minimize the length of the pile. Uh, so the goal is to uh, we'll drive them to that, to that, um, we'll vibrate them in about 60 feet, then we'll hard, then we'll impact drive them to the rest away in that kill layer, then we'll get off of them for I think up to a week, and then we come back in and what we call tap them uh, to try to drive them again, and that <coughs> this the. Um, information we get from those blows gives us the bearing strength of the pile. And then at that point, uh, when we have the information, um, we're going to cut the piles off uh, where they are along the wharf so that they don't become a problem. Yeah. And then uh, the piles over at PO01, we feel that we're going to leave those in place. We think we can incorporate them into that new structure. Okay. So I'll pull my questions. Um, so again, uh, what work is going underway is basically uh, uh, preparation for the geotech report and the test power driving. Um, we've had one uh, change order uh, to a task order with a no cost time extension for task order eight uh, to make sure that we, that we were running up against the, our performance period and we still had to get reports in from the MOA vendors, so we extended our task order to allow that to happen. There have been no change orders with Kiwit. So issues, they said, um, <coughs> we finished our qualitative analysis of NASA's requirement changes for Terminal 1. Um, we've looked at basically at, at the combined potential impact of the, of the four requirements and they're listed here. They would like 120 foot wide deck versus 70. They would like four cranes versus three of the uh, ship to shore uh, cranes, uh, gantry cranes, they would like uh, those cranes be a 100 foot gauge crane versus 50 foot gauge crane. And they uh, they are requesting an end panzer belt system for the power uh, versus the uh, elevated bus bar system to support current vehicles. So we looked at the uh, impact and the impact barriers between them, and some of them are, are basically if we do a 100 foot gauge crane or we do the wider board, uh, the cost difference is. You know, we have to do the wider work for the 100 foot gauge crane anyway, so so there's some concurrent costs. Basically, if we look at them uh, in total, it's a $62 million impact, uh, potential impact to the budget, and it's 1.3 years impact to the construction schedule. That 1.3 years is primarily, uh, you're almost doubling the width of their work, and so that significantly increases the construction period for Trump from one, primarily due to power graph. Um, so we provided that analysis uh, to the board. Uh, budget. Um, during the last two months, um, there's not been a significant change to the budget. You can see the budget report here. Um, we're 14 percent spent on uh, program man project management. We're 63 percent spent on miscellaneous project support, and I think uh, uh, the reason that that's a high percentage is that a lot of those costs are vendors that are just completing their work and knew that it would be happening during this time period. And then um, the test pile were eight percent spent and then uh, zero on the respite. So overall we're two percent spent. There's been no change to the funding uh, level 
make a couple of comments. Uh, just a couple of things to point out. Uh, we talked about the GAC. Uh, the lively debate with GAC has been going on for as long as I've been in the court, the better part of eight and a half years. And uh, you, you, can't, you can't imagine the relief of finally getting a closure with those guys and finally getting them to a position where they didn't think we were walking in the door hedging our bets on anything. And everything was laid out above board and the conversations were pretty intense um, in, a, in a few of those meetings. But at the end of the day, you know, they agreed that the solution that we presented for how to give them the requirements they expected us to add to this for survivability, uh, for them to support that uh, was huge. And, uh, and it's nice to kind of close that chapter after, after a very long time. We're not done with them. We promised them we're going to continue to go back and keep them abreast of what's going on so that they can stay aware of the, progress, of the project as it progresses. But, uh, but that, was a big, that was a big win, and, and I appreciate the hard work that went into doing that. The other thing that I wanted to, I wanted to thank the Assembly for, for supporting our, you know, that last minute addendum item for the Safeguard Marine Simulations uh, that we need to do this February. The reason why we need to do it in February is because if we can't get it done in, we are the last group into that building before they shut it down for eight months to do asbestos abatement. You're doing this down at the university? Back down the sewer again. Okay. You, were, you went the last And time. is that who did? That yes, Safe Safeguard Marine were, were the, uh, the yeah. choreographers, if you will, that got all the pilots in and got the tug yeah. operators in. And, uh, and ran the simulations. So how is the second phase different from the first? We're, 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 taking a, we're taking a different look at getting in and out of Terminal 3. And what we didn't do the last time is we didn't add a third tug to the, to the approaches during construction. So what's being added into the simulation this time is a third tug, uh, particularly in ice conditions and in the winter windy ice conditions. Uh, one of the things that came out of the first set of uh, of tests was the recommendation that there be a third tug. It provided a level of safety for, for navigation in and out of the port under construction that wasn't there before. So now we're gonna add it and see what a difference it makes to the uh, to the approaches. So it's one, one tug in front, one tug in the stern, and, 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 and one tug to keep the dock front, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an extra tug to keep the dock front. You need to break up the yeah. Now we already know that adding that tug adds $16.5 million to the cost of the project. That's in the $290 million. What's not in the $290 million is the $62 million to give Matson what Matson wants. Now that's, you know, that's part one. The other, the other part of that 62 million of it is 40 of that are four 100 gauge cranes that Matson said they would pick up the tap. I was going to say, are they going to? So in essence, the delta, the delta between everything that we're we're going to design and that which we're asking the legislature legislature for is about 22 million, and and that we need to work in the meantime. How do we work some of that? Well. Cooking with Tug and Barge and Tote are both members of the Salt Chuck family. Uh, Matson's ponying up 40 million. So we have an intention of going back to Salt Chuck and saying, hey Salt Chuck, would you cover the cost of the tug? Are they getting anything out of it in terms of uh, better service, faster travel? Safety, better safety. Uh, Tote for years has been harping for a third tug, even getting ships to the, this current dock. So this kind of satisfies that requirement. Back in the day, the expectation was that it would be our, on our tab because cooking with Tug and Barge was privately owned. But now that they've been bought by uh, by Foss Maritime, which is a member of the Sawchuck family, there's an opportunity to ask that group to attempt to match the private sector contribution that Matson's making of 40 million by picking up the tab for the tub. So I think we can probably get somewhere with that. And what and what that leaves is six million dollars. And and we can make the port can make six million dollars in two years by avoiding having to do the power repair program, which is three million dollars a year. So that puts a little bit of money back in our coffers to be able to cover that delta. And by the time we get to where we're going to be doing that, then we should have we should have the funding in hand to make you know to close that gap too. So that's why that's not in the ask. Are we adding some of the things that Matson asked for, like the sheet pile across the face of the dock? Uh, well, we 
are we are proposing to them, uh, and, and uh, I'll give you the rest of that password. Okay. We're proposing to them that the wider wharf is a better solution. We really don't want open cell sheet pile yeah. anymore. I'm gonna I'm gonna step back a carrot. Well, you'd have to put holes in I'm gonna show you some pictures of what Port McKenzie is trying to fix right now. The next three pictures. That's what happens. That's 14 year old open cell sheet pile at lengths of 60 and 70 feet. Why didn't we have these pictures before we went down that path? Hey. Well, because there was no blowout over there. <laughs> but now there is. That blowout happened this summer. That, yeah, it just happened in September. And what was the cause of it? Ice behind it? Uh, uh, you know, you'll never. You'll never get the you'll never get the answer yeah. to that. Uh, a part of it is uh, corrosion. And how old? Is because it? those were not galvanized sheets. Uh, it, it's a, it's a fourteen year old dock. And they were small, uh, narrow gate. I mean, they were same as ours. Okay. Same. Everything was the same except that the ones that we purchased for our facility were galvanized, and those were not. It started out at about four inches. They welded some gusset plates to kind of hold it in place, and the back pressure over time. Even broke the gusset place walls. Well, I'm a little worried that's about what that pressure. That's what I was worried about on the mass. Yeah, well, and, and, the, and the way that, the way the science works, and or correct me, because I'm practicing engineering without a license. Yeah. You know, the longer those things get, the more likely something like that is going to happen because the greater the pressure behind the wall. That's mm -hmm. just common sense right there. Yeah. Forget about engineering. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you so, know that. So where, you know, where. Matson would like to do this puts us in the 60s. This puts us basically where we are on the north. Yeah, where we have the problems on the north extension with those big long sheets. So we're reticent to embrace doing that as the solution. Now, the real reason why Matson is looking for that is because it gives them more land. They want more land. We think there are better proposals we can make with the real estate we already have to provide them a larger footprint than, uh, than having to add 20 extra acres water side by using that by using that design and that technology. Besides, you know, we're in court with those guys now. It doesn't make any sense to embrace a design that we're suing the same designer of record for uh, for giving us in the first place. But that's just me. And just, I don't know. Yeah, just to be clear, you know, and, and, and I can't speak obviously to the court issue. But, but the concerns that have been raised is not that design entirely. The concerns that are raised is that design in this application with that that height of wall in this type of environment. And so, and this, so this, if we could if we could get Matson to agree that there's a solution to their footprint requirements without doing that. Then I think we've uh, I think we've solved the problem for them, and they'll and they'll accept our solution. I think uh, uh, most of us would agree. The more we can stay away from the water, the better. <laughs> so uh, no, but I, I had three primary topics that I wanted to discuss, and you you nailed it because Matt Matson was one of my very first you know uh, high priorities, and I think you helped answer the question about you know what Madison was to have chipping in and what Delta was because that was exactly where I was going to go. Yeah. Um, the next, um, Mr. Jager, welcome to the party. I'm going to focus a little bit on, um, I, I'd like to know a little bit about you and what, as the external affairs person for MLP and AHU, what your strategy is going to be, what you're going to focus, how you're going to um, engage with you. Uh, the strategy is still being finalized, but in general, uh, we're looking at the fact that the Port of Anchorage is really uh, a necessary economic tool for the entire state of Alaska, so that uh, it, our argument would be that it's appropriate that it's subject to state funding as well as just local. Um, you know, 85% of the population, basically, the, the milk they buy, the bread they buy, is coming across that dock. Um, not to mention all the other products from the cars you drive to the cement that's used to, build, to fix the bridge that you know is being built or is for Pogo Mine or for the North. 
that is it really isn't an issue of whether this project needs to happen. Um, we've got a project that right now is scaled for current needs. Um, it's uh, being designed to have a 75 year lifespan and it's being designed in such a way that if business does develop, it can be expanded upon. But the project as it's being built now it is not a build it and enable come project. It's, it's a project that we really need. And there's really not, in our minds, we want to sell the story that this is not a project that we're debating whether the project's needed or not. Um, it's a matter of how we're going to pay for it. And then that will come into the, the third leg of the strategy is to say, okay, here's, here's the debate. How are we going to pay for it? Are we going to pay for it with a state bond? Are we going to pay for it with some sort of public-private partnership? Are we going to try to have the municipality bond for it? Uh, the, yeah, I, I like the eyes going up. Uh, you know, there are there are a number of different ways we can pay for the project. What what does it really mean uh, in terms of the cost? And who's going to ultimately bear the cost? If you have, for instance, a, a public-private partnership, the the cost of that deal is going to be seen in every loaf of bread and every gallon of milk that gets sold. So, as a uh, resident of the state of Alaska, you will be paying for it. You just won't have. Well, either way, we're going to pay. That's right. <laughs> and, and so the question is, is, what's the most appropriate way to do it? Okay, so that that kind of dog legs into another question. What, what's your background? What kind of relationship will you have? Because uh, with some of these legislators, or, or are you a fresh slate to them? Uh, I'm going to be a fresh face for most of them. I've uh, done a lot of external affairs work. Uh, my typical MO has been to be the guy in the background. Uh, originally, I was a journalist, where I was an editor, so I was the guy in the background. I won't hold that against you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask you which magazine it's in. I know. That I might. I'm just kidding. Well, I know I just told it. Uh, <laughs> so to speak. That was, that was actually many years ago. I was also uh, the, they called the corporate communications director at Siri, for instance, when Fire Island and uh, Takata Commons were being built. Um, and the, the general take was if you saw me, that was probably a bad thing because you know, we had a problem. You know, otherwise other people were speaking, but um, I was very involved in all of those projects and everything from working with the legislature to get funding for transmission at Fire Island to um, you know, dealing with sign ordinances for the kind of comments. I have done a lot of government relations, and I just tend not to be the, the face that everybody talks to. Okay, I just want to make sure we don't have somebody that as soon as you walk in they cringe. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I don't, get I, don't that, think so. I don't get that impression when I first meet you. So, and, and I was very clear, you know, I've been very honest on the record about some of the strategies when uh, the strategy, and this is segueing into my second topic, is the strategy of going forward with the general obligation bond, asking the, the state for that. Um, I was intrigued in our legislative packet by going forward with one top, with one project because I thought, well, if you're going to do it, that might be the winning strategy. Um, over the last uh, two months, I think since that was kind of hinted to us, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to a lot of legislators, and I'm not getting a warm reception at all, at all. I was actually surprised. Um, and um, so, you know, two parts to that, and I made it clear Tuesday night at the assembly meeting, part of, this, part of the reason I'm not getting a good reception is the fact that they know we're in legis litigation, and they know there's a, a probability that I don't know how high, we, we, they didn't put a number on it, but they, they assume there's a probability that the city of Anchorage will have a significant, uh, or potential for a significant, um, you know, money coming back to us. Right. And so, um, you know, the, the feeling I'm getting is um, there's really little to no appetite for that large of state general obligation bond. Um, and. Um, it's kind of that wait and see, let's see what happens with the litigation. So knowing that in, we're starting a legislative, a legislative session like that, if that mentality doesn't change, what's, what's plan B? Well, I, I, I think it? the beginning is, is that we need to have a legislative education campaign to explain that at some point the clock is ticking. I mean, every minute that we don't have this project, we have the risk that the exposure that if we do have a seismic event, we are going to have a failure. And if that we have the failure, we're not talking about the court being closed for a week or two. We're probably talking years, depending on what the failure is, of course. Um, and the longer we delay, the longer we have that exposure. Um, other
other other pieces of it, and sorry, I may be stepping on Steve's presentation here, but it's, what we're trying to do is um, roll this project out in such a way that um, we do it to optimize cost and to minimize our risk, and at the same time, we need to keep the port fully functional while we're doing it. So what our thought is is that we will go ahead and kick off the first phase of the project. Uh, if you look at the, the handout, um, the first phase of the project is basically dealing with stabilizing some of the northern extension. That would be work that was done during the original port expansion project. Um, so we'll go back and fix some of that problem. And we will also work on installing, building the new uh, fuel and cement dock, POL1. Um, and we'll do those first for two reasons. One, by doing it in that order, uh, we, can do, we can start that project fairly quickly with money that we have in hand. Uh, and that will uh, simplify and improve the safety of the second phase of the project because it improves the access for Tote to uh, its terminals. It will also, we, we can't start working on the terminal two, one, two, replacement until we've moved the existing fuel and cement dock off of there. So we have to build that new fuel and cement dock before we can start the main terminal work. So we'll get that going right now with money that we have in hand. The second phase, uh, the terminal two, three, uh, around, uh, it's replacing terminals two and three, so it'll be the new terminal one and two. That work, once we start it, we really can't stop. So we have to have all the money for that project in hand uh, because in order to keep the port operating smoothly, that project's got to be sequenced and continuous. So the thought is, if we get the bond, that will be the, the money from the bond will pay for that project and we can move forward with that project and we don't have any unknowns. Will the litigation be successful, that sort of thing. We can just get it done. Um, and we will start the project and get it done. Now, the remaining pieces of the, of the project, POL, the, the second fuel uh, dock, and then finishing the uh, northern extension stabilization and finishing the terminal three demolition, we can run the port without that work. So that if we had no more money, it wouldn't be an ideal situation. We would be missing out on some business opportunities but we can run the port, we can get the cargo that we need to get into the port right there. On the other hand, now if we win uh, the settlement, or we get a settlement that's a, a good settlement, that can come back and we'll use that money to pay for these. So it's not that the settlement money will just disappear into the general fund legislators. Uh, the settlement money will go back to what it was really meant to be to finish the See, and that there, it, from what I'm hearing, and I have to tell you, you know, I've, I've made a, a significant effort to talk to members of finance specifically. Um, and what I'm hearing is if there's any even chance for this to get through the legislator, legislature, they want to guarantee that if we want to settle them, they get the money back. That's, that's what I'm hearing. And so, so as we have that discussion, you know, I guess what I want, I, I want you guys going to do an understanding more, you know, I, I'm an open book, I'm, I'm telling you what they're telling me. And and, sure. I, and I also understand where they're coming from. So I, we have to have a concurrent plan B going in case we have a failure. I don't want to wait until April or May and go, okay, now what do we do if we have a failure? And you don't have to say it on the record necessarily, but you know, I, I'm sure you guys are smarter than I am. I'm sure you guys have already been thinking this. So I'm just trying to, you know, I promised I would I would make the effort to talk to with legislators that that I have relationships with. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry this is Aaron Lath because uh, you know, your message isn't lost on us. The decision makers are not us. You know, how we go forward, with, with what the plan is going to look like when we go forward, we're going to take a lot of advice and guidance from the committee for it. We're part of the team, not the message deliverers that are going to get put on the ship and sent to Juno to carry, to carry the water ourselves. So, but but your point your point is well taken, and that's well worth considering. Uh, now, I, I can also add that you know, the, the pieces that are left at the end that we may we may have to do the mopping up on 
again, are not the high cost stuff. Right. The, the, the highest cost, the highest yeah. cost is going to be finishing the rest of this removal. Right. That's that's a pretty chunky, costly thing. And by the time we get to here, we will have years and years and years of operating with it looking like this, and we can decide whether we actually have to do that or not. Okay. You know, we may lose the ability to, to use all of that real estate because the stability issue never gets solved. Uh, but outside of where the line gets drawn or where a failure potential point would be or not, the rest of that is open for for revenue generation going down the road. To to move this petroleum that what was the cost of moving POL two out, Jim? Uh, POL two, I think thirty five million. Yeah, I mean that is you know that's a tiger grant size project. Uh, it is a uh, you know the new you know the new transportation bill allows for you know dollars to be they're putting dollars aside for infrastructure of regional and federal and, and national significance. We we meet that definition at this point as well. So there's opportunities and there's a capital budget that we can finally start to build. Particularly if we're done with the with the legal part of this thing, I mean, legal cut is going to start to cost me about two million dollars a year. Those power repairs cost me three million dollars a year. Five million dollars a year between 2017 and out over here begins to begins to make a, a, a capital budget that you can do this kind of stuff with without having to ask anybody for any money. So it's it's, it's not an unrealistic plan. And then who knows who else would, might step forward to help contribute to that if the petroleum companies think it's silly to have this set back in the shadow, we need to bring it out, then uh, then there's an opportunity to do some kind of a partnership agreement with them as well as time progresses. So I, I think there's ways to handle that which we're not asking for money for that won't adversely impact the business support. I think we'll, we'll know a lot more come uh, the end of the legislative session where we need to go. but. Sure. It's interesting, yeah. and, I, and I, I, I'm personally planning on flying down there on my own dime yeah. to, to do what I can to, to see how things are going. Yeah. You know, the, only, the only criticism I, uh, I would offer, and, and, and I'll base this on the fact that I've got a lot of scar tissue on me, uh, and, and so do some of the other members of the board staff that have been around for a very long time, is a lot of the folks who have those kinds of concerns have never stepped foot on the board. That was, that, uh, just to follow up, that was going to be my uh, second, one of my other questions that I just forgot about. I was going to ask how your how your legislative basically uh, uh, field trip came. How many? You know, did you have an opportunity? Oh, we, we had uh, uh, Dan Sadler and uh, Harry Drummond uh, and Max. Uh, yeah, Max Brunger. Yeah. They were the ones that came on the most recent. And, uh, and you know, the last time we went out, we had the you know had the mayor and Mike and uh, and and you know, the, the, unfortunately, you know, the weather's at a point now where there's really nothing to see because the piles are iced over. Uh, you know, the ideal time to have done this, and, and nothing we ever do elegantly winds up with session. <laughs> and, and and when folks are not preparing to go to session and the in the, in the conditions are right to do this, everybody's busy doing other stuff. So it's kind of hard to get folks down there to lay eyes on it. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take long once you've actually seen the condition of these piles and what it is we've done to repair the worst of them. And and you, you, you've been along too, haven't you? Yeah. The, the yeah. point is it, it isn't it isn't that we need to do it. It's that they need to pay for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what I so. When I spoke to the, when I spoke to the caucus on Saturday, you know, there were two things that I asked them to, yeah. to keep yeah, in mind. One, one, one of them was a, was a favor. It was you need you need to understand who's running your court. We're not dopes. We really do know what we're doing, and uh, and we've learned from the mistakes of the past. Have no interest in repeating it, yet, and are committed to this. And we've moved on. You know, we're not agonizing over the way things used to be. I mean, we're, you know, we're looking forward to taking this on. And you need to come and sit with us and convince yourself that you can have confidence in this team. And and everybody's sitting up there, uh, Harry Grumman aside, side, have never been down before. Yeah. So that bothers me. That if bothers we get me. money back, it goes back into the project. Yeah. I mean, if we get settlement money, settlement money will go back into the you might, you might consider doing a lunch and learn too down in Juno, sending a team, buying them lunch. I mean, it, it's it's if you can actually educate them with pictures 
and yeah. do that, I think it might be that's, helpful. That's a great idea. I appreciate that. I also told them to please go back and tell their colleagues that whether they like it or not, this is the Port of Fairbanks. It's the Port of Houston. It's the Port of Big Lake. It's the Port of Palmer. It's the Port of Wasilla. Go back and take the That's the Port of Kenai. That's the Port of Soldotna. That's not the Port of Anchorage. It's the Port of Alaska. At Anchorage. Yeah. So we need to reinforce that in the state. And if we need to come with a policy decision out of this committee, then you come with up one here and bring it to the assembly that if we get money back, some of it goes back to the state labor force. Because we set policy, not paid for. Okay? If you look at the city charter, we set policy. And if our policy is that they reimburse the state, then that's just what the aid firm will have to either veto it or move on with it. Well, and to your point, Dick, that might be the only strategy. Because, like, like I said, I mean, I'm not, you know, I present information and try to get feedback and get a quote on where they're going to go. And, and I'm being very, I mean, I, it was adamant. The city of Anchorage is making a huge mistake by, by just focusing on the port. And, and the reason being is because they're concerned about that litigation. So if, well, if we, we can, can address it that way. I think if we come up with something here on your committee, every all of us here, that we then bring on the assembly, send down to Joe, this is a policy that we're going to give the state back their money when we get a settlement on this. Anybody who gets goes back into the project and... I don't know. We need to take care of the policy decision here, not the four. They set, they follow policy we set. Well, and I and I still like your idea. I mean, I heard what um, Mr. Abbott said, but I still, I think you just said it. Um, I, and, and it's to reinforce what Steve was saying. You said it at the last meeting, but the name of the Port of Anchorage. It is the Port of Anchorage. Port of Alaska Anchorage, just like but if, Yeah, CAA, if it was Alaska, the Port of Alaska at Anchorage, yeah. I think it would help reinforce that. Well, we take out the amount of goods that come through here. I'm sorry? We take out the amount of goods that come here. Yeah. It goes distribution to the entire state. Yes. Our there are people falls. The state's going to be hurt measured by every community in Alaska. Yes. We will all start starting. There are other the organizations that would like some of that business, however, Whittier and Seward and... They're going to get hit by the same yeah. earthquake we yeah. get hit by. Yeah. yeah. There, so, there are two problems with that. Time. One, those ports are set up as export ports. Yeah. And and the second, well, there are actually three problems. The second one is they're going to get hit by the same earthquake. Same and way. the third one is that Anchorage has something that those ports can't have. And that is we have the location, but well, we have the location where we have 85% of the population within, what is it, a 90 minute drive? Or 75% of the population within a 90 minute drive of the port. Uh, and we also have the intermodal connection. So the Port of Anchorage has marine. It also has rail, it has highway, it has airport, and it has pipeline. You're the distribution grid. Yeah. That's right. Good. And that distribution grid has not been paid for by the port. That distribution grid is all kinds, hundreds of millions of dollars of state and private money that is not going to be replicated elsewhere. Or if it was, it would take years and years to do it. What I'd like you to do, Amy, with Tim, is give it the legislators to so see what kind of language they would like because you've got a lot of people in the different aspects of finance out of setting your area. Okay. Ask them what kind of language they'd like to say that would fall in their cars. They need to sit down in this kind of environment and have a discussion, mm -hmm. but they don't have a history of a lot of things. We need to reach out to them. Well, and that's why I say, you know, I've been down as you know when they do these lunch and learns, and it's an opportunity, even if they can't come, their, their staff will come. So, you know, I say, you know, from a, from a, a poor perspective, look up and see who's on finance, and then tr just try to get with their staff and schedule a lunch, a lunch and learn where you have pictures, and it's not just, uh, it has to be dynamic, and, and it has to, but, but I, you know, like I said, I, I'm trying to do my part, and I well, reach out and ask them what kind of language they need to see in there. Okay. Then we'll work on what we can do to make that happen. I'm going to extend this. Uh, do, Sorry. Do, do you have uh, um, do you have more discussion that you want to have? No, sir. To some of the no. politics. I, I, I think Jim did a good job of walking through the uh, yeah. the sequence there. If, if the only the only thing I would have added was that, and in the end, we get to exactly what it was we've been talking about for two years as what it is we need. Uh, the journey from how do we where when do we start this and, and doing what 
all the way down to how we sequence it may have been shifted around a little bit to uh, to accommodate some of the requirements of the tenants down there and also to you know to match up with where it's practical for uh, to ask for money to get it done and, and, and what can we what can we run the risk of leaving and be and feel pretty comfortable if we left it there it would it would not be pulling away from anything and what it is we can eventually fund and get done ourselves. So that took, you know, we, we put a lot of thought into that so that the number that we go down to Juno with was was about as, this is out of our wheelhouse to, to come up with, can you help us? We don't have the money to do that. And that's the big part of the project are those two docks. Yeah. And so, so somebody to has to borrow for it. Do we borrow for it and increase fees or whatever we do? Or do, uh, do we ride on the state's credit rating, uh, us contributing the cost of financing or something? But, um, but it just seems to me that uh, it's got to be done. We've got to have the money. We've got to keep, on pro keep making progress on it. Otherwise, uh, yeah, we're just asking for trouble. Right. And so uh, I, I like the fact that the geo bond is where it is, uh, you know, in terms of the use of the money. That's the logical place for it, and uh, then we pick up the extra on the end. But uh, uh, who's got the best credit rating? Do we have a better credit rating at the moment than the state does? I don't know. Yes. Can we borrow cheaper than they can? Uh, and that's that's a, a point from my point of view. Uh, but but if we're going to be successful down there, we are going to have to make some other toys, and I don't know if the administration has plans for that or not. But um, we need to have a discussion with, uh, with the folks that right now are in June and are going to be preoccupied for some time with money issues. Sure. And so. Uh, well, to go out of notes. So, yeah. uh, so the question is do we need to extend this uh, or uh, at the moment? Does it mean no? Amy? Uh, no, I, you know, I, just, I, I want to put on the record that considering when I came on the assembly, <laughs> where the Port of Anchorage was at. I know the last administration made a lot of changes, um, and, and I have to say, I think one of the best things the assembly has done, I, I am glad to see Shum Hill is involved. Uh, Lon, I've been impressed with, um, you know, just the clear dissemination of information, and, and I have to say from my perspective, Steve, that um, when I, every time I have had an issue, or I'm able to pick up the phone, call you or Todd, and ask this direct question, I don't get any political spin, I just get the an answer. And I, I, when you tell me something, you know, I always have that mentality when anybody says anything, trust but verify, but, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm being coached. I feel like you guys have done your homework, and I do have confidence in the leadership of the board. I want to be very clear, and you know, my compliments don't come easy, so. <laughs> But, but but it's one of those things, you know, and, and to me, uh, I know the economic climate the state's dealing with, it's going to be very hard to sell to get any money yeah, we know or a bond. I mean, with oil closing, BP laying off, I mean, the whole nine yards, this is the perfect storm. And I guess that's why if you can bring any message back from the, to the administration from this committee, from my perspective, it's you better have a strong plan B just in case. And that's why whether it's exploring more opportunities for public par private partnerships, um, whatever that fancy mechanism is, um, you know, I'm not so thrilled about making this a port, uh, city of Anchorage bond because obviously we have a smaller population base and make all of our property payers pay for an entire state project. I think it's problematic. So, um, whatever it is we can do to assist to get the project done, I'm I don't have this is Amy's solution. It has to be Amy's solution. I hey, I'm up, I'm happy for plans B, C, D, E, and F. I mean, we can keep going. To me, it's just I want to get it done, and I, I want to do it as cost effectively as possible. So, however I can help, like I said, I'm going to take time and effort um, out of my own pocketbook to fly down to Juno and and see what I can do, and hopefully be that bridge to get legislators in the city together. Um, so I'll try, but whatever you need from us, I think we're all willing to, to help. Okay. Ignoring ignoring the issues are not going to make them go away; they're just going to make them more more difficult. The problem with the port, from my point of view, has been uh, with the last attempt uh, was management. Was the fact that we gave up the management to somebody else, stepped back, and let them do it. Well, they didn't, do it. and so that was a big mistake. We did the same thing with the computer system. 
where we uh, we gave it to a contractor and said do it and stepped back and didn't do our proper due diligence. So I, uh, I applaud you for what you have done and for what you will be doing. Um, but we've got to do it right. We've got to be involved. Thank you. Okay. I love that was Mayor George words that said I've got Mayor Ed to manage this. And the assembly just ate into what he was telling us. Well, it's the easy way out, you know, you don't yeah. have to work. You're able to take care of it. Well, I don't think you'll see this only make that mistake anymore. Not again. <laughs> no. uh, thank you guys. Really I appreciate, appreciate you coming up. And uh, I know we have heard some of the information before, but the context is good. Uh, it's right with regards to what the legislature is doing right now and what our taxing issues are statewide or our financial system statewide. Uh, but this is one of those required operations.